staff member at ASRC, Mark Boharnwa. I will review the lecture protocols and introduce tonight's lecture host. As you can see on your screen, uh, this lecture, uh, the question and answers and all messages that are sent to the chat will be recorded. And the recording will be available at some point in time into the near future on the ASRC YouTube uh, page and channel and an email will be sent out how to access that. Uh, your video and audio is disabled until the post-lecture Q&A. You may submit your comments and questions at any time to the chat feature. Any clarification questions will be addressed by the speaker during the lecture and any other chat comments or questions will be handled by the moderator during the post-lecture question and answer period. If you have a question and you'd like to raise your hand, please wait until the post-lecture Q&A, and you can use the Zoom raise your hand feature to do that. You will be asked to unmute and enable your video if you so choose. And please remember if you're going to ask a question to keep the background noise to a minimum. Tonight's lecture host is Christopher Thorncroft, Director of the Atmospheric Sciences Research Center and full professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences at the University of Albany. <clears throat> Dr. Thorncroft will provide a brief history of the Falconer series, introduce tonight's speaker, and will moderate the post-lecture question and answer period. Director Thorncroft, I invite you now to share your screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, yes, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all here today uh, for this uh, first uh, uh, lecture in the Faulkner series this, this year. And I wanted to give a bit of a history uh, and a bit of introduction to SRC at the same time. And, uh, you know, the, the series is named Honours uh, Ray Faulkner's uh, Legacy and uh, a bit of history here. So in 1961, Vince Schaefer founded ASRC and shortly after, uh, hired Ray Faulkner as ASRC's first full-time employee. So that's a, a, a special moment. So Ray was often referred to as Mr. Weather from his early days as a weather observer atop Mount Washington in New Hampshire to his work at the General Electric Research Laboratory in Nobel Laureate Irving Lamia's Project Cirrus. Ray was an enthusiastic disciple of the atmosphere. His boundless energy was poured into public education on weather and the environment and his popular radio weather commentaries, his articles, and his lecture series made him widely known as the voice of the ASRC. And on, on a personal note, I, I've been in the States 20 years. One of the first times I went into the Adirondacks for doing some tourist stuff, I bumped into a, a, just a random person in the Adirondacks. I, met, I mentioned what I was doing and I said, oh, do you know Ray Faulkner? Or do you know, they, they, people know, people, people all over the state know who he is. So, um, Ray initiated this lecture series actually soon after arriving in the summer of 62 at Whiteface Mountain. And in 1973, ASRC expanded the series to include a spring version of the Urban at the Urban. <laughs> and I saw there was one comment that hey, still has not gone, gotten the fix. That, that's probably a ground issue. Okay. Um, there will there will also be a summer series, by the way. Somebody was asking earlier on. So this series is deeply rooted in ASR's history and offers scientists a unique opportunity to engage with the general public. And indeed, we have a fantastic slate of strong inter interdisciplinary talks this year. And I would like to thank Dr. Craig Ferguson and his committee for doing a fantastic job. Um, I want to take this opportunity briefly also to um, share with you some of the, the things that are going on in ASRC, uh, educate you maybe on some of the research that we do and mention a few people um, ASRC has a strong tradition in, in air quality and atmospheric chemistry uh, through Jim Schwab's uh, uh, group. And also I'd like to honor again that De Dr. Sarah Lance in our, in our center uh, recently got a career award. The first, the first, the faculty member to get a career award, NSF career award in the center. We also work on boundary layer meteorology and everything that goes on close to the ground. Um, we have an artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, lab laboratory, and we are collaborating and participating in a $30 million uh, institute that's led out of Oklahoma, but we are working on uh, using AI for making better decisions with winter weather. Uh, we work on weather and climate and including cloud and aerosol processes, for example, and weather extremes. And we have great strength in renewable energy. And uh, Richard, we're gonna learn more about that today from Richard, and we also, who's emphasizing uh, solar energy. We also have uh, another colleague working on uh, wind energy, Jeff Freeman. 
Um, I would like to say one more thing um, about this year because it's very special. Um, we are going to be moving into a new home and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us uh, next year uh, when we when we host the seminar series here. And this is just a fantastic uh, opportunity for us. The center will be moving in with the department uh, as well as the New York State Mesonet, the Center of Excellence, the Excite Lab will be there. And as our local National Weather Service uh, Weather Forecasting Office will also be there. It's a dream come true. Uh, and will be and will be great for collaboration. Um, we'll also be co-located in this building with the new College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity, as well as environmental engineering. So it's it's a great opportunity for carrying out interdisciplinary research. And this is located on the Harriman campus, and many of you have probably seen it. So that's uh, I would like to now go on to move on to the uh, to the uh, uh, the main uh, feature of today's uh, lecture. So I'll I'll come out of that. So, um, I'll stop sharing so that Richard can actually load his talk and I will introduce uh, Richard. Um, so Richard Perez, uh, as I said, leads the solar energy research at New Albany's ASRC. Uh, he has served multiple terms on the board of the American Solar Energy Society and as associate editor of Solar Energy Journal. He has produced over 250 journal articles, conference papers, books, and chapters. He holds patents on energy storage and load management using PV. He has received several international awards, including a certificate for outstanding research from the US Department of Energy, American Solar Charles Greeley Abbott Award, the first International Building and Daylight Award from the Velux Foundation, and International Solar Society's Farrington Daniels Award for outstanding contributions in science, technology, and engineering of solar energy applications, which lead to enhancing our world and conditions of humankind. Very impressive CV, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Richard, who's working on such an important area uh, not only for New York, but for the nation and the world. So we're talking about big stuff here. So welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hope you can see my screen and hear my voice. So we are going to talk about big solar in New York, uh, meeting the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act challenge. I would like to quickly acknowledge a few people that helped me prepare the, some of the facts I'm going to present today at Clean Power Research, Pace University, and University of Rome in Italy. So we are going to ask why we need big solar and how you do it. And key questions will be, can solar power almost everything? What happens when the sun doesn't shine? How about cloudy winter months? Is there enough land available to do the job? And at what cost? Is it going to bankrupt the economy or is it going to be very inexpensive? And finally, we are going to spend some time on how it happens. Um, a discussion will be that the policy factor is probably as important, if not more, than the technology factor to make big solar happen in New York. So just the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, CLCPA for short, by the numbers, it's 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emission by 2050, 100% zero emission by 2040, 70% renewable energy by 2030, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035, 3,000 megawatts of energy storage by 2030, and 6,000 megawatts of solar by 2025. Bottom line, remove 22 million tons of carbon. And on, on top of that, remove uh, 22 million tons of carbon through efficiency and electrification. Those three numbers are, are the ones we are going to, to compare to, to look if, if they do make sense or are they enough, too much, or too little. At the end of the talk, we'll come back on those sets of numbers, wind, storage, and solar. So why first? Uh, we, we do have a problem that's uh, slowly but surely is uh, strangling us. And the good thing, quote unquote, about it is that 90% is traceable in indirectly or directly to energy consumption. So it's good first to take a look at the way we consume energy on planet Earth. So the planet consumes about 19 terawatt year per year. A terawatt year is about 10 
trillion kilowatt hours. It's a big uh, unit. And we've been supplying that demand with the four big uh, resources, natural gas, petroleum, uranium, and coal. And these are the reserves, the finite reserves of those technologies. So we have many, many years of supply if we want it. But they are finite, and that's a problem in itself. Then we have some renewable resources. We have wind, and wind is that's a number per annum, that's per year. So wind is a very large resource. It could supply the planet many times over. Wave energy is a bit smaller than wind, quite a bit smaller. It's a byproduct of wind, so there is less of it. That's an old technology, ocean thermal energy conversion from the 70s and 80s, which has more or less been abandoned, but it exploits the, the difference in temperature between the top and the bottom of the ocean. It's big, but quite limited, could not supply the planet. We have lots of biomass, but if you heard about and using corn ethanol, it's, uh, it's a limited resource as well. Even if we converted all the food crops into fuel, that would be not enough to power the planet by far. There is hydropower, which is renewable, but limited by the number of rivers to do. There is geothermal, and that's using current, currently available technologies. Probably if you dig deep enough, you'll find more, but at, at a cost, currently available technology would limit it to a few places on planet Earth. And then we have tidal energy, which is very minuscule compared to everything else. And then we have another renewable, that's solar energy, and that's uh, much, much bigger than everything. And if you look at all the renewables, they are just first and second order byproduct of solar. Solar creates the winds, that creates the waves. So there is just about the same difference between solar and wind than there is between wind and waves. The energy is degraded and you get less of it at the end of the day. So between solar and wind, we have a... Uh, a big resource, we have a big solution that could supply the planet forever and many, many times over. And for solar, the instrument to exploit that resource is increasingly photovoltaic electricity production technology. And one of the important aspects of the energy transition is that much of the energy we use, major sectors can be electrified either directly by switching, say, from fuel to heat pumps for HVAC, or indirectly with the production of e-fuels. Hydrogen is one of them, but you can also make uh, all the way to regular gasoline and kerosene through the Fischer-Thropes uh, technology starting from electricity. But will that transformation bankrupt us? Is that too expensive? So one of the very important aspects about photovoltaics is that it's becoming the cheapest way to make a kilowatt hour of electricity today on a pure energy basis. And that's from Fortune magazine, not, not a green paper in general, but they acknowledge the fact that photovoltaics has become very cheap. This is the turnkey price of a utility scale photovoltaic power plant from the time I started working at ASRC back in 1985. So it has gone down a good 20-fold, and it, it's not going back up. There's technology is getting better and cheaper and more massive. So we are today at 900 per kilowatt. When I started, it was almost 16,000 per kilowatt. By 2030, it's going to be half of that, and by 2040, a third of that. So it's cheap already, but it's getting cheaper. And even on an energy basis, that's a report, annual report from the Lazard Bank. I don't have the 2020 yet, but last year the PV was already uh, cheaper than combined cycle gas and on par with the utility scale wind. So we have a big solution and it's uh, also prospectively a cheap solution. But then comes the key question, what when the sun doesn't shine? Because when I compare to the bottom right here, uh, gas, uh, wind, and solar, it's a little bit of an unfair comparison. Natural gas and coal and nuclear, they work all the time, or you can turn them on and off at will. The utility managers can manage that, but 
solar and wind, they are at the mercy of the weather and the seasons. So it's not a very fair comparison at that point. So the thing with solar is that it's intermittent. Here I have plotted the random day output of solar energy from morning to evening. So there is nothing at night. It goes up in the morning, then clouds come in in the middle of the day, and it varies up and down, and then goes back down in the evening. And what's, what we need on the power grid is something that's firm or dispatchable to meet the demand. That's a profile of the demand, typical profile of the demand for New York State here. So it doesn't quite match. And as a result of that intermittency, solar and, and wind, they do occupy a so-called marginal position on the grid. They need dispatchable resources underneath to, to absorb them because that's the supply doesn't match demand. So you need a bulk of other stuff to make it work. So, and they don't have a grid dominant position yet. And that marginal position, that intermittency, I, I think is at the root of the tension that exists uh, of late between utilities and the solar industry. Because each time a solar plant goes on the grid, it generates that type of noise that you see on the left, and someone has to manage it. And the people who manage it today are the utility companies, the grid operators. They have to do it. So they, they want so much of it, but something has to be done to put more on it. And this is what happens within a day. That's a small problem that could probably be resolved with uh, storage. But the bigger problem is what happened on a multi-day and seasonal basis. This is the solar supply of, uh, of a roof in Albany. So you can see there are many days, especially in the winter season on the left, going so, so we go from winter, summer, winter, many days without much output here, big holes, supply droughts. And what we would need if we want to have a grid dominant position is a way to transform that into something available 24 7 and 365 if we are serious about transforming these power plants into wind and solar so how do you transform uh, an intermittent resource into something that's firm and dispatchable 24 365 and storage is the solution and it works in a technical sense uh, if you have excess production, you put it in reserve storage, and if you don't have enough, you take it back from storage. There is only one not so small problem with that is whether the run of the mill photovoltaic electricity is very low cost, as we've seen from the Lazard report. It's very cheap. This is a scale of cost per kilowatt hour of energy produced firming it up with storage and making it available 24 365 is cost a little fortune and the reason is that you need so so much storage to make that happen and the detractors are very quick to point that out it is increasingly clear that viable renewable energy technologies like wind and solar are unlikely to meet the grid what power demand by themselves i mean that, that was washington's finest that old man with a cane broke down. He could barely walk. Are we back home, Mark? Yeah, we're back. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. I heard a bunch of noise. So I don't know where we cut off, but the fact that firming up uh, unconstrained photovoltaic kilowatt hour, making it up available all the time is very, very expensive. Even if I consider very low cost future storage costs from uh, Tesla from 20 years in the future, it still would be such a massive reserve that it would be unthinkable. Um, some of the detractors are fast to, to point that out. This is unless you think a little bit outside of the box and you overbuild and throw away some of the solar output. So instead of building just what you need on an energy basis, you overbuild, say by 30 or 40%, and by design, you throw away some of the output. And when you do that, 
something very interesting happens. So here on the x-axis of the chart, I have the amount of energy that I'm willing to shed and lose from my solar system. And you see the white line is the cost of the firm power. The blue line is the contribution of the storage system and the red line is the contribution of the solar photovoltaic system. So if I overbuild and curtail, my solar goes up, the red line goes up slightly, but you see the storage needs go way, 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 way down. And as a result, we reach a point where the white line, the firm kilowatt hour that you need all the time is almost within affordable reach. You reach a sweet spot there at about 40% overbuild in that case. It's so effective, in fact, overbuild and curtailment that we found a better name for it. We call it implicit storage because it does the same thing as storage. It enables storage to do its job, but doing it at a much, much lower cost. And we have several studies to back it up. By 2040, we, we did a big study in the central US. I'm going to come back on this one where the goal for 2040 is a grid dominated by PV and wind at less than five cents per kilowatt hour. Many subtropical islands in the Caribbean, in the Indian Ocean, 100% PV solution, also very low cost, 10 times cheaper than they pay today with diesels. And my colleagues in Itosi did um, a similar study where they found out that a grid also dominated by PV would lead to Italian power at less than five cents per kilowatt hour. The thing is the, the solution to make it possible doesn't work today. You, you cannot monetize overbill and curtailment within current regulation. It doesn't work. No solo developer that I know in their right mind would overbuild a PV system because they would be losing money big time. So we're kind of stuck here when we could be there. So obviously the solution is more dependent on the regulation and policy than on technology in that case. What needs to happen is a way to monetize firm kilowatt hours available all the time instead of monetizing what like we do today, the unconstrained, the run of the mill solar kilowatt hours. So we need something that embeds everything that makes that firm kilowatt happen like storage and overbuild and curtailment. And that could happen, say, with instruments like power purchase agreements that would remunerate firm power instead of unconstrained power. And at the same time, we have to evolve away from what we do today that remunerate all the production. So we have uh, power purchase agreements that are very often used for many projects in New York and elsewhere. In New York, we have something called VIDER, Value of Distributed Energy Resource. And you're all familiar with NEM, which is short for net energy metering. If you have a PV system on your roof, you probably take advantage of that. And it's also the basis for all the community solar systems we have here. And I'm, I must say, I take full advantage of it myself. I have, we have a big solar house with a big PV system. And financially, it works great for us. Net metering is a good way to finance system. But I know I'm not resolving the, the big, uh, big solar for all with that. I'm taking advantage of it and a few of people who can afford it and have houses can take advantage of it. But I know it's a recipe for keeping solar marginal. It's not the recipe that you need to make it green dominant, at least cost for everybody. And uh, if we do that, the future looks bright. We could have very cheap electricity available all the time and basically forever as long as the sun will shine once we build all those power plants they will they will have 30 years lifetime and they can be prolonged beyond that and pv will be much cheaper in 30 years so we're talking cheap electricity cheap energy for as long as the eye can see in the future if we do that switch and that number doesn't come out of a hat. It came from a very serious study that uh, my colleagues at Clean Power Research, and it was led by my son, Mark, who works at Clean Power Research, the MISO study. So the MISO is a big interconnected region, a little bit like MISO that we have in New York, but much bigger, runs from uh, Louisiana all the way to North Dakota. And I'm going to take a quick look at Region 7 here, because Region 7 is Michigan, and it looks 
climatically very similar to New York. And there we found out that the sweet spot mix of 55% PV, 40% wind, and just keeping 5% natural gas, legacy natural gas, at least as a transition, would lead using an overbuild of about 50% over size. That would take us to four and a half cents per kilowatt hour by 2040, and by 2050 down to less than four cents per kilowatt hour. So that region, the, the power coming from conventional generation from coal, gas, and nuclear is about in that realm. So you're not talking about changing anything. You're going to have cheap power available all the time for just about the same price as we pay today. If you want to know more about that study, it's at the, they have a website called the Minnesota Solar Pathway Study. And um, you can contact me offline and I can send you there if you want in the future. But the reason why I showed Region 7 is that it's so similar to New York in many ways that we have not studied New York yet in detail. We hope we're going to do it soon enough. But those numbers that we derive from that part of uh, MISO are very likely applicable to New York with probably maybe more wind of shore resource than, than in Michigan. And let's let's look at what happened if we want to do everything in New York, electricity, but also the switch transportation to electric and switch all the building demand to electric. Um, what does it take if you want to do it and how much PV do you need to do that? And most importantly, where do you deploy it? Because uh, if you overbuild, you may need quite a bit of space to do that. And, and there is a a bit of grassroots opposition, not in my backyard solar power plant that I can see right and left in New York. So it's important just to take a look at how much space you need to, to apply that big solution. So first, let's look at the uh, demand side, how much energy do you need? So let's take a quick look at the US first. This is the electric uh, consumption of the US, nearly 4,000 terawatt hours per year. This is the Terrestrial transportation, if we convert all the trucks, trains, and cars to electric, this is how much uh, energy the, that fleet would use. Quite a, quite a big number as well. And this would be the residential and commercial HVAC consumption, heating consumption, after you transform to from fuel to electric. So basically, big switch to heat pumps. So total for the US, it's about 7,000 terawatt hours. This is the picture for New York State, so about 5% of that. And you'll notice the contribution of uh, HVAC is a bit higher in New York because the heating load is proportionally bigger than for the state as a whole. So this is how much PV you would need to do the job to do about 55% of it, the scenario that we've talked about. You'd need almost 200 gigawatts of PV. That's about 30 times more than the current plans for 2025. So it's, it's a big chunk more. Another way to look at it, you would need about 360 square miles. So that number is a little bit scary. You can picture a 360 square mile giant solar farm cutting forests and everything. It, it looks in your face and until you put it into some context, so is there enough land available to do that? That's 360 square miles here, that little yellow part in the question mark. So it, it's big, but not all that big. Um, most importantly, where would we deploy? So we looked at it in, uh, in two ways. We looked at it from a land use standpoint. And we looked at it in a uh, in an end use activity standpoint. And I'm going to go through those two uh, scenarios here. So land use first, this is a land distribution from USGS from New York State. So it's dominated by forest by a big chunk. Then follow the, the farmland, wetlands, and then you have the high density urban to suburban sprawl, some open water, some open land, and some barren land. So we did a scenario 
and any scenario can be discussed, but this one looks mild enough. Let's take 15% of the urbanized space, mostly roofs, 5% uh, of the suburban sprawl space, some roofs and some backyard system, 5% of floating PV on open water. Floating PV is a technology that's up and coming. And let's take only 1% of the farms. I think at the end of the day, it's going to be more of the farms because it's a good source of revenues for struggling farm sector these days. But just let's look at that number. And that alone gives us um, much more than we need, about twice as much, which is not, not too bad. And let's remember that what we call forest today was not always forest. If we look back 120 years ago or 140 years ago, Forest was much, much smaller in New York. Um, all the rest is farmlands that have been abandoned by farmers who moved out west to exploit the, the Great Plains and California. So this is 650 square miles in, the, in that forest stack here. It's not all that much, not inconceivable that you could use some of it. So there is probably a lot more space for the taking that we need. Another way to look at where to deploy is to look at end use activity. So here we would deploy PV without functional modification from the current usage. So you have roofs, of course, you could put PV on roofs without changing anything from what happens underneath the building. And if you look at a, at a city, at a, or a suburban city, it's it looks like a giant solar collector to me. All that roof space that you see, commercial, residential, there is a lot for the taking. And that alone is uh, almost 200 square miles using half of the space available. Another thing that's quite interesting is all those power lines right of ways that crisscross the state. If you fly on a plane and look down, you'll see more than the road, you'll see all those big trenches of power lines. And that number is pretty staggering. It's uh, 160 square miles worth of uh, power lines using 75% of the space available under the lines. You have gas pipelines with a big uh, right of ways as well. That's a bit smaller in New York. That's only 20 square miles, but it's still quite a acreage. You have railroad right of way. If you use 75% of it, you have 21 square miles. And there are some technologies which would make very smart use of, of the railroads by putting the PV in between the tracks. You have expressways. And if I only look at the center lane, which would be possibly the easiest space to deploy it, um, we already use center lanes, as you've seen in downtown Albany. That's, that's an expressway center lane that produces oil. But that alone is 12 square miles in New York. Then there is an interesting piece of real estate that can seem far-fetched today, but if you project 10, 15 years down the road, it probably will be a no-brainer. There is a lot of space available on vehicle and vehicle integrated PV, VIPV. Now there is a se full session at the IEEE conference on VIPV. All the big manufacturers are looking at it. But there is quite a bit of real estate on wheels in, in the States, all the trucks, the semi trucks, all the cars. If you add it up and you use 50% of it, you get 21 square miles of generating power that can produce power directly for motion, which is good. But when it's not moving, it's part of the grid. And then you have landfills and industrial and mining exclusion zones. And we have many in the States that account to about almost 30 square miles if you are used to use half of it. And you have parking lots. And we did a study many years ago in New York State that led us to think that we have close to 25 square miles worth of parking lot available for the taking. So all in all, just looking at those is about almost 500 square miles. And I didn't look at some other sectors where you would modify just a little bit the, the function like agrivoltaic deploying pv on farms where you could farm underneath the pv or graze uh, sheep even cows underneath those things and give a revenue to farmers and floating pv i didn't count those in it but and 
taking just a little bit more of the forest around the right of ways because that forest is not of it is old growth you have probably much much more than 500 square miles for the taking so which way, whichever way we look at it either from a land use standpoint or an end use activity standpoint there is much more space than we need to do that big solar solution in new york so there is room to grow for sure and also things are going to happen we may need may not need that much of it there will be higher efficiency photovoltaics here i use state of the art 25 percent efficiency but 15 years from now you'll be closer to 30 or 35 percent so you probably will need less space and also i didn't assume anything happening on the demand side and um, part of the clcpa is to reduce demand aggressively as well so those numbers may not be as big but this is just an upper limit and that upper limit is already uh, you can deal with it in a big way there is room to grow and we're just about to publish that's just been reviewed and it's in the final uh, uh, realm of publication here in solar energy journal where we did that exercise for every single state and that paper will come with an interactive web app where that scenario that I run for New York, you can run with any number you wish for any state. So local planners can do what if I deploy PV on 5% of the farm since of 1%, how much room do I have? How much of the power can I use? But you can see that there is room to grow in every single state, except I think Washington DC, which is totally urbanized. But even New York or very dense states like uh, New Jersey, or Connecticut, there is tons of room to grow beyond beyond a 55% big solar solution. And in out west, the room to grow is, is gigantic, like almost 3000% in uh, Wyoming. So that, that is not far-fetched. There is plenty of room to grow. That's for New York. So how do those numbers compare to, to the CLCPA that I presented earlier? So for PV, if I contrast that 190 to 6,000, we are about 30 times too short currently. Hopefully things will change. If I take the contribution of wind supplying 40% in that scenario, we are we could use about four to five times more. And that 3000 megawatt of energy storage is probably way underestimated. And something I never understood about the C CLCPA is that they talk about storage in terms of megawatts, when we know that storage is costs as a function of megawatt hours, it's an energy thing. So it's a little bit unclear, but we're going to need quite a bit more of storage to do the job at the end of the day. So how it happens? Is it technology or policy? Well, technology is going to get better. We know that. But the big thing is that we need a big technology breakthrough. We need to monetize that firm power instead of what we do today. Because today we are on a road to marginal uh, solar and possibly marginal wind as well, or very, very expensive solutions. And another thing, and that's being done more and more, is to actively plan where to deploy, uh, take, take notice of all those spaces where you can intelligently deploy PV and plan for it in, in a very smart way. So if you do firm power monetization, that's going to ease the tension between the grid operators and the solar industry. They got, that's going to make them partners. And if there is a nice plan on to where to develop, it's going to ease the tensions between uh, local communities, especially upstate and the solar industry that is nascent today. And I would hate to see that happening in a, in a bigger way. So if with smart regulation and policy, I think we have a winning uh, virtual uh, circle here, as opposed to, uh, to a marginal spiral of death. So if you remember something today, remember that big solution, 
It's also an inexpensive solution if it's done right. It's a 24, 365 solution, not an intermittent solution. And it can also be a resilient solution. And I'll speak more about that maybe in a future talk. We have a big project that we are putting together that in addition to being there all the time and clean, it can also be resilient down to the, to the household. So go through severe weather and anything like happen in Texas, for instance. But it's in dire needs of smart policies ahead and regulations. That's the key thing that needs to happen. Because if that doesn't happen, we're going to be stuck in a marginal solar with a, the big four playing a big role for a good long time. So before I, I close, I'm going to finish with a small epilogue here. <clears throat> um, on the question of can solar power almost everything? And the thing is that we're already using solar power and we are using it whether we're conscious of or not massively, we're using tons and tons of solar already. We we'll just take it for granted and we don't notice, but that powers all the forests, all the crops, all the rivers, everything, and it powers the, the daylight out there. And a question we asked a few years ago with, with some students is, what would it take to if we had to generate daylight with uh, conventional means using oil, for instance, and light up the outside all the time, like it happens today, at least half of the time, how many of those uh, giant ship do you, would you need to carry the oil around to do the job? And we calculated how many sheep, sheep it would take. It would take a lot of them. It would take 110 millions of those ultra large crude carriers running around the clock, around the planet. And that would cost about $50,000 trillion per year to the US. But not to worry, we would run out of oil in two days. So solar, we're already using it a lot. We just are not aware of it, but it's a giant resource for the taking and we can use it for just a little bit more than daylight. We can use it for electricity, transportation and buildings. So on this uh, last view of the, the spheres here, I will thank you for your attention and be happy to take any question you may have. Thank you, Richard. Um, so the future looks bright. Um, so we have a couple of comments and questions. Um, In fact, I had, I had a few questions here that were posed beforehand. OK, go for it. So I could go for it right away. Yeah, sure, go do that. So recycling of solar panel materials given advances in technology that make existing panels out of date. So the leading technology of photovoltaics, silicon panels are fully recyclable unless they are, they are made, but the well-made panels are, are fully recyclable. That, that's basically glass that can be recycled into new PV panels. Will uh, future technology make existing panels out of date? All the economics I presented today are based on current technology, future price, but current technology. So it works. If it's better, it's better. It's going to be cheaper and bigger. But if a power plant is built today with a state of the art technology, it's going to operate for 30 years and it, it will make uh, economic sense. And when it's at the end of its life, it can be replaced by something cheaper and better. Second question is uh, potential of using targeted cloud seeding to open holes in long term cloud cover, what condition make it feasible, economically and necessary. Month long stratus cover from Mississippi to Maine, for instance, in 2030. Um, well, I'm not a big fan of uh, geoengineering on the clouding side, cloud seeding side, although it, it's uh, it's what created ESRC in some ways, the cloud seeding team at uh, GE. But uh, we've seen that even with long cloudy period in winter, the, all the numbers are presented are based on that happening. Like you could have 20 days of cloudy weather in winter. And if you design the system right, it's going to work. If you overbuild it right and find that sweet spot, you can go through everything. So it works. 
I don't think we need cloud seeding to make it work. And finally, if power storage improves and access to these becomes simplified over long distances, a big ask are these areas of the globe where solar power and centers would be superior. So that analysis that was led for MISO by Mark, uh, my son, that was based on his PhD at Columbia. And in fact, he started asking the question, what if we connect the East and West US, a power line, how cheap is it going to be? What if we run cable underneath the Atlantic from the Sahara to, to New York? Is that going to work out? And at the end of the day, he found out that you, you really don't need to connect over long distance. You may want to connect a few states, but then if you spread the resource continent wide, it's not going to get you much cheaper and it's going to be a headache. So a little bit of transmission, but not all that much. The, that overbuilding implicit storage solution works wonders at even on, on limited uh, scales. Okay, thanks, Richard. So just to remind everyone, um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to write it in the chat. Or if you go to the reactions down on the bottom on the right in the Zoom window, you can see a raised hand there and uh, we'll unmute you and allow you to ask a question. Um, so let me, uh, uh, there was a couple of questions here that already in the chat I saw. Um, just a second. I'm sorry that the window changed when Richard left. Um, so, uh, C. Cantel asks, what is the status of optical antennas, the PV with 85% efficacy? Well, it's still uh, up and coming. It was um, up and coming when I started working at ASRC in 1985. And it's still uh, the same status today. So, can you explain to me the question? I, I'm not following that question, actually. Can you explain? So, there is a technology that uh, instead of photovoltaic conversion, you use antenna to capture sunlight. And on oh. paper, you can demonstrate theoretically that the it can transform 85% of the incoming sunlight into electricity as opposed to 25% for photovoltaics. Okay. So it works well. And it, I've known about it since I started working at ASRC. Unfortunately, if in theory it works well, in practice it has not been demonstrated successfully mm. at all. So it was up and coming when I started uh, 30 years ago, and it's still up and coming, a little bit like fusion. Always good promise for the future, but not not something that you can uh, nut and bolt your hands on. Okay. Um, John Gansus asks, uh, what are climate change models predicting about future cloud cover in New York State? Well, a good question, and I have a good colleague at ASRC. Uh, I think he's here, Jeff Jeff Friedman, who just had a big study about it from a nice order sponsored study, and the consensus is that. Uh, if it evolves at all, it's going to be less than a few percent. So it, nothing to worry too much about yet. OK, a question from Craig Ferguson. What is the current footprint of wind farms in New York? Why is PV not installed between the wind turbines? Good question. Number two is um, that's for the taking. That's uh, currently they have cows or farms. But yeah, you can put PV under wind farms for sure. And in fact, uh, I think my, my former supervisor, Ron Stewart, and Bruce Bailey, when I joined the SRC, published a paper just about that, but combining PV and wind farms. And the footprint of wind farms in New York, I do not have that number out of hand. Maybe if you can unmute Jeff Friedman, he could have that number handy. What number was that? I was just responding to the, the different <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the footprint of wind farms in New York in terms of area? Yeah, I mean, you have about 2,000 megawatts. It's it's less than, if you think about um, a typical wind farm taking up, uh, I mean, the idea is you have an array of wind farms. So you have the spacing between wind farms of about a few hundred meters to a kilometer. But the footprint itself of a, of a wind turbine is maybe a couple of acres so we're, we're only talking about for for the 2000 or so megawatts that have been deployed you know maybe uh, several tens of square miles at least uh, you know total land maybe a, 
up to 100 square miles, I would say, at most, that have wind farms on them. It's all 100 square miles. So it, it's still consequent compared to the 300 square miles you'd need for solar. There is a message in the chat from Kathy Moore, too, telling me that she's, she's worked on some projects combining wind and solar. <clears throat> I don't know if it's New York or elsewhere. Okay, we have a long question from Jason Allen, I think. Uh, uh -huh. All right. Vitor. I mean, Jason, maybe it'd be easier if you just unmuted yourself and asked this question. But do I do that? Or somebody unmute Jason? Yeah, okay. I, yeah I just I, I unmuted. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just read what I wrote here. I do like Vitor because it's not NEM. And we've been able to sell a lot of solar projects on CNI. Uh, roofs in the capital district because they're getting compensated monetary credits, uh, not net energy metering, which could be three to four cents if you're if you're compensated on a kilowatt hour basis. And I also like uh, Vitor because it does value dispatchability, right? So if you put a battery, if you're available at higher supply, higher capacity uh, hours during LSRB hours, you do get, you know, you may see 14, 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So um, can you explain the PPA model that you're advocating a little bit more? Who are the counterparties? Is it between the host slash developer and the utility, or is it with the end user? That, you know, I think if you want big solar for every single uh, citizen in New York, you, that distinction between the host and end user will have to go away. So currently, Vida works well. And in fact, I must say that I, I I'm at a few of my colleagues and I are at the root of that Vida stuff in New York. 15 years ago, we published about it. We used to call it smart fit, smart fit in tariff, which is exactly evolved in New York to be called Vida. And about five years after we published that stuff, we realized that that's a recipe for marginal solar forever. Because it, it works well for a developer today, you get a high, high value stuff, but it's still constrained. You still value every single kilowatt hour. You want to maximize production, get the highest value for that. You're going to get dispatchability within the day, maybe with a small battery and, and get away with it. But you're not going to get firm power through 30 days in winter. So that's, that's a recipe for marginal solar in the long run. Of course, all the solar developers I know, many of them, they love Vida. They make money with it. That's their... Uh, bread and butter. That's why I say the regulations are so important to spell out new, new remuneration pathways for PV, which are based on firm kilowatt hour. So you, you would remunerate PV to, to its own value. And even as myself as a net energy meter customer, and, and I get more than five cents here, I get maybe 10, 11 cents per kilowatt hour on my roof. If I had the right contract with the utility, letting them uh, manage my system, curtail when they need to, to, to make it the best for, for the grid, if, if they give me the right contract, the firm power contract, I, I would switch right away. So what needs to be done is to spell out contract that remunerate firm power, as opposed to everything we do today that remunerates uh, energy all the time, because that will confine solar at the margin and doesn't resolve anything about intermittency, the, the big intermittency, the seasonal one. And the second part of my question is storage economics. Where do you think batteries need to be at a dollar per kilowatt hour cost on the CNI and residential side in order to make sense? Okay, so here you're asking your question, what happens to make sense within the, the, the current uh, system where you would, so the economics I presented today embed storage and that PV and wind. So I, I used the annual production of storage for about $100 per kilowatt hour by 2040. So it's not what the economies of storage need to be to make it happen. They, they will be low cost enough to make it happen on the user side, given two day remuneration path, I would say on, on the maybe $150 per kilowatt hour, I, I think. And there, there are other ways to value storage at home. I, I have a battery, I'm looking at a battery, right? My office is in my basement here. And I have a battery there that's being unused most of the time. I would, I would 
gladly give the control to the utility to make it part of the system if I have the right uh, contract with them. But currently, I use it for resiliency, and we we go through five, six power outage a year, and we are. We keep, I think you're. I think going. you're right. The utility value could be huge. Um, and mm -hmm. Green Mountain Power about a month ago just started a new program, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, basically, they can control your two Tesla power walls at your house, and you pay yeah. five thousand for it, which yeah. is great. So with the right system of remunerating people, yep. even even user cited system. If you give the control to the grid operator, that's the way of the future. Right. And then my last question is hydrogen. Where do you see that application working? So hydrogen is the we are agnostic. I'm agnostic as far as storage is concerned. So it could be batteries, it can be hydrogen or e-fuels. Uh, hydrogen, yeah, it, it's fantastic. But for me, it's just another storage. So if it's cheaper than lithium ion, I'll take it. Okay. And currently, it's quite a bit more expensive. But it, the the things beyond hydrogen, because you have hydrogen, and then if you go one step beyond that, you use carbon capture, and you mix the two together, you can do kerosene with it and fly planes. So that would also work really well to, to do a full, full transformation. OK, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. Um, any other questions? Uh, hands up or? Um... Just let us know. I, I I just thought of one thing uh, when I when you saw that map with all the potential um, solar in these big states in particular, I guess. But can you imagine? I mean, I know you propose this that every state can do it, but you imagine little local markets where some of these states will actually do the job that you need to do, and then just I mean, I know, um, just distribute it around themselves, so the other people don't have to do it. But can you imagine any free market or growth that way? Mm, yeah, let's sit down and talk about it. <laughs> maybe we know New York could generate energy for Vermont or something. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's make it happen in New York and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Going, going on. Okay, I'd like to, um, before I thank Richard and close this, I'd just like to make an announcement um, that the next talk um, is Daniel Beverly, and it's keeping with the solar theme, actually, but not renewable energy. It's uh, the title of the talk is Blame It on the Moon, Responses to the August 2017 Solar Eclipse. So uh, join us for that. And um, again, I want to thank Richard for the uh, interesting and fascinating and excellent work that he shared with us. And I think it's also like to remind everyone that uh, renewable energy is a, is a big topic uh, for, for the state and the nation. And uh, ASRC uh, through Richard and also through Jeff, who works more on the wind, are leading the way in this in this area. I think ASRC has a, a lot to contribute to this effort uh, moving forward in the next years and decades. And uh, it's going to be quite an impact, I think, that we're going to make. And again, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for giving the talk today. OK, pleasure. And have a good night, everyone. OK, good night, everyone. Good night.